good to see everyone. We've got a light crowd this morning. Let's stand and we'll sing our call to worship.
Bible study team with them. Have a good vacation. Um, we just thank you for all that you do in our lives, Lord. At this time of trouble in the world, just turmoil in our society, Lord. We just need you more than ever. Please just God bless each one here. And God bless us as we uh, hear, hear the message from Gary this morning. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Okay, right now we're going to stand up and we are going to sing a couple songs. So if you're able to stand, go ahead and stand. We're going to sing Across the Lands and in Christ Alone. And then I'll do scripture reading from Ephesians. And then we're going to sing one more song after that, The Power of Christ. So here we go.
1, verses 3 to 14. Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. Give you a minute to get that. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. May God have his reading. blessing on the reading of his word. Uh, remain standing. We're going to sing one more song, and then you can be seated.
If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 2, and while you're doing that, we don't know if Pastor Randy and the family are watching this live right now. If not, they'll be watching this a little bit later on the recording. We know that. So if you would like to wave to the pastor, you can turn to the camera and everybody can wave at him back there. Uh, we are praying for Pastor Randy that he might have a great time of uh, reconnecting with the family refreshing in the faith and the spirit and maybe even catch a few fish because uh, he'll be disappointed if he doesn't. So. Also this morning uh, it was mentioned that uh, Tom and Kayla are going to be married on Saturday and if you don't know who Tom Reifenberg and Kayla Combs are, it's this couple right over here with the big smiles on their faces. <laughs> They're the ones getting married on Saturday. For now. For now. It's <laughs> a little later this week it just might get a little tense. <clears throat> So, uh, Luke chapter 2, the day that Jesus was lost. Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to start reading in verse 39. When they had completed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee in their own town of Nazareth. The boy grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. Every year his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. After those days were over, and as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know it. Assuming he was in the traveling party, they went a day's journey. And then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search, search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Were you searching for me? He asked them. Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with people. Shall we pray? Our Father, we sang about uh, the fact that, that our sins were laid upon Jesus and that he went to the cross uh, to pay for our, our sin debt, to do what we couldn't do for ourselves. 
Lord, we thank you for thankful for that this morning. We we want to lift you up. We want to praise you. We want you to be here with us this morning as we look into your word, as we see what message you might have for us here today. Father, we do pray for those in our community who need a touch from you, whether it's a physical need, a spiritual need, a financial need. There's lots of ways, God, that we are needy people and that you are there. You love your children and you love to meet their needs. So we're going to look to you. We're going to keep asking you to do that. We're going to keep thanking you when we realize that you have met needs. Sometimes you meet needs we don't even know we had, and we don't even know you're active, but you're always there at work. And so, Lord, we're going to lift you up and be thankful for that, and we're going to share about you to others. We're going to tell people about Jesus and his love for us and his forgiveness for us. And, uh, and Father, we're just going to have a great time today. Pray that you be with the service, and uh, we thank you for all of those who had a part in, uh, in bringing it to us for the, through the music and the, and the instruments and all the other ways. Uh, and Lord, we just thank you in Jesus' name today. Amen. So the day that Jesus was lost, a little, little play on words there. This is a story about the time when Jesus was separated from his parents for a short time. Kids get separated from their parents all the time. It's never a good feeling if you're the parent. But it happens more often than you might think. And so I'd like to share this morning some stories about some kids who were separated from their parents. Sometimes the story ends with a miracle. Sometimes there's a miraculous happy ending. I'm reminded of a, of a little girl who was two years old and lived in Edmonton, Canada about 20 years ago. And on a February night in Edmonton, Canada, in winter, she wandered away from the house and was lost in the woods. And she was out there all night. The next day when her mother found her, and uh, her name was Erica, when her mother found her, she was frozen stiff and lifeless. They took Erica to the Children's Medical Hospital there in Edmonton. And I'm going to say that because of what God did, and through the work of the doctors and the responders, the health care workers, they revived her. And by the time she left the hospital, the doctors were saying there was no sign of brain damage. And they were predicting that Erica would grow up to run and play with all the other kids her age <clears throat> with no consequences from being frozen stiff all night out in the winter. Pretty amazing. A miraculous <clears throat> and happy outcome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sometimes children wander off. Sometimes there are miraculous and happy endings. I'll share a couple more stories for, that, that happened right here in Michigan and just within the last year. In summer last year, again, a two-year-old girl, she wandered away from her family during a camping trip. So, uh, Pastor, keep an eye on Aaliyah. But this girl was only two years old. She wandered away from her parents on a camping trip. And they were out in the woods, and she was lost. And about 24 hours later, she walked up to a house a half a mile away where they found her. She had been out in the woods all night by herself, two years old, and didn't seem to be any worse for the wear. Again, a happy ending. <clears throat> Last summer, uh, actually in the fall, September last year, in Detroit, a uh, little two-year-old girl wandered out of the house while her parents were sleeping and started walking down, toddling down the streets in Detroit. And eventually somebody stopped they got her, they figured out where she belonged, <clears throat> they took her home, and it was a happy ending. And one more story, right here in Michigan, in December, a five-year-old boy went missing, his name was Bo. And Bo was on Christmas Day at a family Christmas party. Bo was with the other kids in the front yard of the house playing on Christmas Day. And pretty soon somebody noticed Bo had disappeared. Well, apparently Bo decided to go explore the pond down the road, and that story ended with tragic consequences. 
Sometimes children wander off. Sometimes children are abducted. <clears throat> I have a cell phone, and at night when I'm sleeping, I put my cell phone on the nightstand next to the bed. Because if there's a family emergency in the middle of the night, I want them to be able to call me and wake me. Many of you probably do that. You have your phone handy, and, and if it goes off in the middle of the night, you're going to answer it. Have you ever been sound asleep in the middle of the night when this awful screeching siren thing fires up and you sit up groggy wondering what in the world is that racket, that rude thing that just woke me up, and you look at your phone. It's not a phone call, but it's something else. What is it? An amber alert. An amber alert. An Amber Alert is officially a message distributed by a child abduction alert system that asks the public for help in finding abducted children. Sometimes children don't just wander away, sometimes children are abducted. It originated in the United States back in 1996. It's called an Amber Alert, and the, the, and the acronym, it's actually an acronym, A-M-B-E-R. America's Missing Broadcast Emergency Response. And so the goal is to get the word out as quickly as possible if a child's been abducted, to help you know, get the authorities there and on the job looking for it as quickly as possible to try to make sure that the world doesn't come to an end for the parent who's lost his child. <clears throat> Back in uh, the 1980s, Carol and I lived in North Texas and there was a little girl in Arlington, Texas. Uh, we were in the town just north of Arlington. So we were raising our sons just north of where this abduction happened back in the 1980s. And we eventually moved back up to this area. But in 1996, this little girl in Arlington, her name was Amber Heckerman. She had been born in Arlington. She was nine years old, lived her whole life in Arlington. She was riding her bicycle in a grocery store parking lot with her brother when she was abducted. And it didn't have a happy ending. But we all know of Amber. The Amber Alert, although it's an acronym, it was sort of named after Amber. And so something good was made out of her life, even though it didn't have a happy ending at the time. That was the Amber Alert. Sometimes children are abducted, sometimes they wander away on their own, sometimes it's a happy ending, sometimes it is not. The incident we looked at today is the life of Jesus, and it does have application to us today. So as we look at Luke chapter 2, the day Jesus was lost, we see Jesus as a 12-year-old boy. We don't know much about Jesus during his childhood years, do we? We assume he was like any other 12-year-old boy. He lived sort of a quiet, um, unsensational life, we think. There are only two stories in Scripture. From the time Jesus was born until the time of his baptism by John the Baptist. In that timeline, from birth until then, there are only two stories in Scripture about Jesus. The one we saw there in verses 39 and 40. <clears throat> he had... His parents had taken him at eight days old to be baptized, to be dedicated. Eight days old. And so we see at the end of there, at the start of that text, the end of the eight days when they go back to Nazareth. The only other time was right here when he was 12 years old. Now there is, uh, there are these things called extra-biblical books. They are books the one in particular I'm going to refer to is called the Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Thomas is not in the Bible. Back in the days when they selected the material to go into the Bible, and they selected what they felt was the, the inerrant word of God, 100% accurate, they created the canon of the Bible. The Gospel of Thomas was one of those that they decided not to include. In the Gospel of Thomas, there's a couple of stories about Jesus during his childhood. One of them in particular, they say that he molded out of mud, he molded and made a bird 
and then breathed into it, the bird came to life and flew off. There's another story about a friend of Jesus, a playmate who fell off a roof and was killed, and Jesus brought him back to life. Now, these are stories about him when he was a child. However, we don't know that they're true. They're not in the Bible, and that book was not included for good reasons. So even though there were some stories about Jesus, we just have these two here. Some theologians think that this story that we looked at, or that we're going to look at here right now, um, was told by Mary, his mother Mary. The, uh, the language, the Greek language that was used, the context and the style seems to be, according to the resources I read, seems to be consistent with that time period. And in the text we read, it does mention that his mother kept these things in her heart. So it's very possible that Mary herself is the one who shared this story with Luke, who eventually recorded it. And so we're going to look at the story first, and then we'll look at the application of it. The day Jesus was lost. Let's break that down. Number one in your outline, the dedication. The child became uh, strong. He grew, he became strong. Um, some translations say strong in the spirit. I think we could probably say that as Jesus grew during, during those 12 years after the dedication of eight days until the 12 year time, uh, he grew probably physically and spiritually in strength and in size. And so he's, he's coming along, his dedication as a kid, as a, as a boy, is coming along. And we can see part of what happens there. You see the mercy in verse 40, the grace of God was upon him. It says not only did the boy grow up and become strong and filled with wisdom, but the grace, but God's grace was on him. God was working in his life, preparing him for the ministry he was going to have. <clears throat> the mandate in verse 41, his parents went to Jerusalem. Every year, his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival, or your Bibles might say feast, the Passover feast. Every year they did it. And so to them, it was there was no question. Just every year we're going to do this thing. And why did they do that? The motivation is there in verse 42, according to the custom of the feast. Verse 42, when, when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. So every year they did it. There was no question they were going to do it. They did it because it was their custom to do it. And what we need to know is that when they traveled from Nazareth to Jerusalem, they went as a fairly large group. It wasn't just their little family, but all the families from Nazareth families, the relatives of, of Jesus' family, of, of, of uh, Joseph and Mary, their relatives, their friends, others around the town, they would kind of all go, if they were going to make this trip to Jerusalem for the Passover feast, they would kind of all go together. And so as you can imagine, as they're going, they kind of get strung out on the way. And there would be some up in the front, kind of leading along, and there would be some in the back trailing along, dragging along like me because they walk a little slower. You know, Carol's up in the front, I'm near the back. And in between, families and friends are scattered. And if you were a 12-year-old boy, you're probably going to be hanging out with your friends wherever they are in the group. Wasn't a big deal. <clears throat> and so, number two, the disappearance. The feast is over, and they're on the way home, and they seek for him and realize he's not there. The delay, it says in verse 43, after those days were over, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents didn't know it. He delayed, he tarried, he stayed behind for some reason. They didn't know it. And so that night as they get together, they're deliberating among themselves, where is he? They start looking around, because once they all got ready to spend the night, the, the boy should have come back to join his family for the night. And so the deliberation is said that in verse 44, supposing him to have been in the, in the company, in the group, in the family, in the crowd, they thought he would be there. In verse 45, the disappointment, they did not find him. Verse 45 says, when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. Number three in your outline, the discovery. They found him. They discovered him. Right? The search went on in verse 45. They returned to Jerusalem seeking him. We read about that. And they were disappointed when they didn't find him that night, but not alarmed. Because the only place he could have been is back in Jerusalem, where again, 
those days it was safe. You remember the days when you didn't lock your cars and you didn't lock the door on your houses and all of that? And now, especially if you live in the big cities, you lock everything. And it's still my habit. I have a friend staying here the, the weekend with me as Carol's going up to Alaska. And so Larry's been here. And we come in from outside. And I close the door and I lock it. And he stopped and he said, why are you locking the door? Oh, my habit. I lived in Dallas, Fort Worth, and in Indianapolis, and in Atlanta for many, many, many years. And I didn't leave anything unlocked. I still have that habit of locking the door when I come inside. Because who knows who's going to come, you know, even out here in the country. I don't know. Anyway, they would have not been terribly alarmed. But in verse 46, it tells us this becomes serious. Very serious. Why? Well, it took three days to find him. So they get back to Jerusalem. They start looking. They look all day around the city. They look all day the next day. It's not until the third day that they find him. And that's getting pretty serious. Things that probably get pretty tense with mom and dad about that time. And then I put the satisfaction. They found him in the temple in, in verse 46 there. After three days, they found him sitting in the temple among the teachers. So he was, we, would, we could say he was in church. He was in the church building. He was in the temple. Number four, the destiny. We talked about, we sang about destiny this morning. He said, my father's business, I would be about my father's business. Some translations say I, I, I would be in my father's house. Some translations say I'll be with, I, you should have known I would be with my father's people. I'm about my father's business. In verse 46, the action, he was both listening and asking. And more than that, he was, in other words, he was listed as the leaders in the temple, the church leaders, and this would have been, you know, the pastors and the deacons in the modern day and others, the church leaders, they're asking each other questions and listening to each other's answers. And they're, you know, getting into some pretty serious stuff in, in their knowledge of the scriptures and in the Old Testament times. And Jesus is there listening to them ask questions and listening to their answers. But more than that, they were asking him questions and listening to his answers. How do we know that? The astonishment, verse 47, in the first part of verse 48, they were astonished, they were amazed to hear his answers. How did this 12-year-old boy get such depth of knowledge about these things? They couldn't hardly believe it. Well, Joseph and Mary witnessed this. Now remember, they've been searching for three days. They're a little upset. Joseph probably was ready to rip into him. Would you have been? I mean, your first reaction is, oh, thank God we found him. But then, somebody needs to pay the piper, right? Why, is he, why did he do this to us? But Mary steps up and Mary says, son, why have you done this? Not only why have you done this, why have you done this to us. And so it's not recorded what Joseph said or whether he took any action. I'm using sanctified imagination to figure he was pretty upset. <coughs> Mary says, why have you done this to us? Verse 49, I must be about my father's business. Why are you searching for me, he says. He was surprised. Why were you searching for me around Jerusalem? When you came back to Jerusalem, didn't you know where I would be? Now they've been with him for 12 years. They know from his birth that the angel told him this is the Messiah. And so 12 years with him, and he seems surprised that they don't realize what's going on and who he really is. Why are you searching for me? Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house, about my father's business, with my father's people? Didn't you know that? And it says, but in that moment, they didn't understand what he was trying to tell them. They were still a little foggy on that, and they were probably still a little angry about him being missing. So, verse, uh, the, last, the last one there in your outline, the advancement. We're told that he went down with them and came to Nazareth. By the way, Nazareth was north of Jerusalem, but in those days they used language very literally. They went uphill from Nazareth up to Jerusalem. And so now as they're going back 
down to Jerusalem, back downhill. They went back north, or back downhill to, to, uh, to Nazareth, I'm sorry, back down to Nazareth. Since he was obedient to them, his mother kept these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with people. And the next time we see Jesus is at the baptism with John the Baptist. So this incident where Jesus was separated from his parents does have a happy ending. Number one, they found him in church talking with church leaders. That'd be good. If, you're, if your child is lost, if your child has become separated and you don't know where they are, how many of you are going to come first to look and see if they're here at the church talking to Randy? But that's where he was. And so that's a good thing. Number two, their son was about his heavenly father's business. That's a good thing. The parents were reunited with their son, and no harm had been done to him. That's a good thing. And it does tell us that he grew in wisdom and stature, and dare I say that probably those who he was speaking with and sharing with in the temple benefited also from him being there talking with them. That's a good thing. Well, how would this apply to us today? Jesus was lost for a couple, two or three days, <coughs> separated from his parents. So what about today? So here's my first question to you. Does God need to put out an Amber Alert for anybody in here today? Or in the future, is it possible you might wander away from God a little bit or even find yourself abducted from God and we need to have a spiritual Amber Alert? Might that happen? There are some lessons, some spiritual lessons that we can learn from this real life story about Jesus, the time that he was separated from his parents. First, did you notice that when Jesus was physically separated from his parents, the relationship was not broken? The relationship was not broken. He was lost for a period of time, from their point of view, he was lost. But he was still their son the whole time. When Jesus was separated from his parents, they still regarded him as their son. Also, he was never not their son when he was separated. He had wandered away. He was still their son the entire time. More than that, they didn't end the fellowship, or they didn't end the relationship with him. They didn't disown him when he was separated. Fellowship was broken, which would explain why mom and dad could have been pretty upset when they finally get found him and read him the riot act for wandering off and not telling him where he was going, right? They could have been pretty upset. Fellowship was broken while they were separated and while they were searching. They were out of fellowship. Fellowship was broken, but they never disowned him. They never stopped looking for him. They never considered him to not be their son. In the same way, we might wander away from Jesus spiritually. There's probably been a time in your life when you weren't as close to God as you were at other times. You feel a little bit separated from God because you have wandered off. There's probably been a time in your life that that's happened. And it might happen again in the future. We can wander away from the Heavenly Father. The cares of the world entangle us. Before we know it, we're too busy to be in our Father's house and about His business. Before we know it, we're too busy to spend God, time with God in prayer. Before we know it, we're too busy to read our Bibles. We're too busy to even at home pray or read our Bibles. We're too busy to assume our, our, our role, our responsibility in a godly family. We're too busy to encourage one another, which is why we gather in assembly, to encourage one another. We get too busy to do that. We wander away, perhaps slowly at first, perhaps not even intentionally at first, but we wander away we're separated from the presence of God in some degree. 
which separates or breaks a fellowship with God. Some of us could be in that place right now. Some people listening on the, on the live stream might be at that place. Might go through that again soon in the future. And along those same lines, we can be abducted. Can we be spiritually abducted? I think we can. The evil one might ensnare you and drag you away. Sin weighs us down, which separates us from God, breaks the fellowship. Our sin can overtake us slowly at first, but it can overtake us and eventually cause guilt and shame so that we want to hide from God like Adam and Eve did in the garden. Or maybe we even want to run from God. Spiritually, we can wander away or we can be abducted through sin. So now let me ask you this question. How will that end for you? You may not have been separated right now, but if it happens in the future, how's that going to end for you? Do you know it's your choice? You get to decide. When you wander away or have been abducted, you get to decide how that's going to end. Just like Jesus and his parents, they went after him. The fellowship was broken. But when you're a child of God, the relationship is not broken. You're still a child of God. When you're abducted by sin, you're out of fellowship with God. But Jesus is still your Lord and Savior. Fellowship can be broken when separation occurs, but the relationship is not broken. In fact, it cannot be broken. Why is that? God enters into a relationship with us. And when he does, God does not abandon us, ever. What's the scripture say? The Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. When you become a child of God, he's going to be with you till the end. God never quits. He never quits on us. We may become separated due to our own choices. But when we repent, and repent is just a big word that means turn around. If you're walking towards sin, and you decide to turn around and walk away from sin back towards God, that's what the scripture calls repentance. When it says we need to repent and come to Jesus, it means turn around from the sin you're in and come back toward God. When we repent, we turn from the sin, we turn back to God. The relationship with God is still there. If you were a child of God in the first place, it's still there, and the fellowship is reestablished immediately. Terry shared with us this morning as he read in Ephesians, and let me just highlight a couple of verses there, verses 13 and 14. Verse 13 said, In him you also were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. Now let's put that in a little different order. The first thing that happens chronologically is you hear the word of truth, and you realize that what's being shared with you, this word of truth, is the gospel, which will lead you to salvation if you choose to do that. So you hear the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believe. You hear it, you think about it, you decide to do that, you believe, you become a child of God. You become part of God's forever family. And then, back in the first part of that verse, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit after that happened. God does not leave you or forsake you. He seals you with the promised Holy Spirit. And verse 14 goes on to say, the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession. If you've ever bought a house, you get a mortgage, you know that you give a down payment, earnest money. And that's the picture here of the Holy Spirit. You, you say to the, to the seller, you can take your house off the market. I pledge to you that I'm going to buy your house. It might take two weeks or a month to get through all the legal paperwork, right? But I'm going to buy your house. And as a promise to do that, I'm going to give you $1,000 or $5,000 or whatever it is. I'm going to give you that as earnest money. And what I'm saying to you is that if I break my promise, I will let you have that money for free. I will lose that money. Now, nobody gives $5,000 in earnest money thinking that they're going to break their promise. 
and they're going to give that money away. And that's what the Holy Spirit does here. God says when you become a child of God, the Holy Spirit comes into your life as God's earnest is security until the redemption of the possession, until the time that you pass from this life and go on into heaven when you're fully redeemed. He does that because you're a possession of his. So Jesus wandered away from his parents to do something he thought was important. Spiritually, we can wander away from Jesus, maybe even thinking we need to do something important. And they anxiously look for their son. Jesus anxiously looks for us. He watches for us to come back when we moved away. When Jesus was reunited with his parents, his fe the fellowship was there again. And it's the same with us. When we're re reunited with Jesus, when we come back, our fellowship is completely restored. And if you're out of fellowship right now, it can be completely restored. So how about it? Anybody need a spiritual amber, amber alert today? Or next time you do, have you wandered away? Have you been abducted? And God needs to put out an amber alert. Are you on a journey without Jesus? So here's the conclusion today. You had a couple of fill in the blanks there. You can lose a sense of Jesus' presence in your life, even though once you were close to Jesus, it may have occurred slowly over time or suddenly. And in either case, in our lives, sin is always the cause. If you think you're moving away from God for a, important, a good, important reason, sin. Sin's causing you to do it. It's always sin. Number two, when you lose a sense of Jesus' presence in your life, that will lead to a loss of fellowship with Jesus as well. It has to. If you walk away from God, you're walking away from the fellowship. Number three, but believers can, can't ever lose their relationship with Jesus. Believers who have that Holy Spirit that's going to stay with you till the end cannot lose the relationship with Jesus. During a break in the fellowship, Jesus is watching and yearning for his children to come back. And finally, when you, whether you have walked away or you were abducted suddenly, you can choose to repent and return and be back in full fellowship with Jesus. You know, there is so much in our lives that we get to choose. There are Bible studies that we can do in small group or that you can do in Sunday school classes, all kinds of materials talking about the things we get to choose. Every morning, you get to choose your attitude for the day. You know that? You get to choose. You can wake up and say, oh my, a uh, couple of the people here, you know, a couple of a couple of folks recently have had a real sore back, have bad backs, hurting, a lot of hurting. Well, guess what? A couple of days ago, maybe out of sympathy pains, my back started hurting. I haven't had this in a few years now, and it's hurting pretty bad. I could choose to get up and it wasn't hurting so bad that I just that I couldn't completely move. But I could choose to have a good attitude about it and try to work through it, or I could choose to let it get me down, be depressed, and ruin my day. And we all have that. Whether it's a, a spiritual need you have, or whether you're out of work, or whatever it is, you get to choose your attitude. You also get to choose, if you're separated from God, you get to choose to undo that. It's your choice. Everybody has the choice. I could say, unfortunately, Jesus won't force you to return. Jesus won't force you to come to church. He won't force you to do anything. But that's not unfortunate. It's because God gives us sort of a piece of what he has. He gets to make decisions. He has free will. He gives us free will. We're not forced. We're not, we're not just following like little lemmings toward the cliff, and we've got to do exactly what God wants us to do. We're not forced to do that. 
We get to choose. We have some decision in our own. And that's a good thing. My plea this morning then is this. Let's be obedient to Jesus. Let's not be guilty of living a single day without the experience of his full presence, his full fellowship, and the full blessing of God, of Christ, in our daily walk. The word blessing simply means the favor and the gifts that God gives us to make us happy. That's what a blessing is. A favor, a gift that God gives us to make us happy. Why not take all the favors and gifts from God that you can get to make you happy? You can choose to do that by staying in the right relationship with him. Let's pray. Father, perhaps there are some here today, and, and perhaps all of us at some point in the future, are going to go through an experience where we feel like we're not as close to God as we used to be. And because of that, the fellowship is not as good. In fact, the fellowship can be completely broken when we're away from God. But we see here in the story of Jesus, and when he was separated from his parents, we see the good news that the relationship is never broken. While we're separated, while we're out of fellowship, the relationship is never broken. If we had that saving relationship in him in the first place, and we are a child of his, the relationship is never broken, and it's never too late to turn around and go back. All we have to do is repent, turn around, and draw back closer, and he will draw us closer. He wants to draw us. We just have to turn around and look to Jesus, and he'll draw us. So God, may we be encouraged by knowing that Jesus always wants to be in fellowship with us. And may we be encouraged by knowing, God, that all we have to do is choose that for ourselves. And he will make it happen. And he will preserve us until the last day. So, Father, as we think about and we pray and our hearts go out for those who have tragically been separated from a child, we would never wish that on anybody. And we pray for the peace and comfort of God in lives where that's happened. But we also don't wish it on ourselves and on those here in the service this morning. And we pray for the peace and comfort of God and the drawing of His Spirit to bring us back. And we pray that everybody will do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Do we have to close the do. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. Let's all stand and we'll sing our clothes song. <laughs> Yeah.